Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a sunny day in, in sunny Norwich here, um, and we're doing another one of the virtual clinics uh, with uh, Maria and Mr. G from, uh, from Morfield and UCL um, about children, uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome in children. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, there's a bit of housekeeping to do first, as they're always with me, as we know. Uh, so as I say, if we can try and keep our, uh, microphone, our microphones muted and our cameras off, and uh, please don't be tempted to share the screen. It does happen from time to time, uh, but uh, sort of leave all your buttons alone. That tends. So uh, we, here we are again um, as, as one of the Macula Society virtual clinics. Um, as part of the Working Age and Young People Service, which I run, so my name's Colin Daniels, uh, we've, we started these uh, sessions in response to the, the new normal or COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and here we are still running them once a month. Uh, we've done all sorts of different webinars on different rare diseases, uh, things like diabetic, diabetic macular edema and bests and uh, Salisbury's dystrophy. Um, and uh, I did um, find out about this piece of work that Maria and Mr. G was doing into Charles Bonnet in children. Um, and I was very fascinated by this because I have Stargardt disease. Uh, when I was a young man, I was used to swirling lights and also, and I just thought that's what people saw. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I started working for the Macular Society, or, or actually with an action for blind people, uh, that I found out that actually probably I was, I was having some of these difficulties that uh, Maria has uh, been looking into recently. Uh, there's a couple of other people. Uh, so the um, uh, patients is my support worker. Sort of keeps an eye on things and makes sure everything ticks over nicely. Uh, got Jerry Hode, who's the research manager for the Macular Society. Do you just want to say hi, Jerry? Hi, everybody. I'm going to help with the questions at the end, Colin. You yes, right, yes, yes. I think that's the thing. No problem. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about the research that we're up to as well. near the end, if that's okay. Is that right? Yep, absolutely fine. Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, so, Maria, welcome. Thank you, Colin. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining me this afternoon. So I'm going to use some slides. They're more of a prompt for myself, um, but I will definitely be talking through everything. Um, and then very happy to answer any questions. So I'm just going uh, to... Just, just on that score, Maria, I just, really just let everyone know that the chat function is open. Um, so questions during the session, uh, just pop them in the chat function and then Mary and Maria, they'll get to them at, at, at some point uh, during, during the session. So thank you, over to you. Sorry, just gonna share that again. <laughs> There we go. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully all of you may be able to see my slides, um, but uh, it's an absolute pleasure as um, Colin introduced me. Um, I'm a consultant ophthalmologist. I work at Moorfields Eye Hospital and Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. And I specialize in genetic eye diseases and in inherited retinal diseases. Um, I also lead a research team at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology and the Francis Crick Institute in London, uh, where I essentially um, dissect um, the uh, molecular basis of uh, retinal diseases. So, for example, if I see you in the clinic and I undertake genetic testing um, and we find a gene, we take that gene to the lab and we try to understand how that gene works in health and how it, when it doesn't work properly, how it causes diseases. And then we try to identify potential um, therapeutic targets and develop new treatments that hopefully will come back uh, to help patients in the clinic. But as a side of that, um, I'm also very interested in clinical research um, understanding the natural history of uh, inherited retinal diseases, 
um, and uh, the complications that can arise from sight loss. And this is where I started to look at Charles Bonnet syndrome, uh, very much in association um, with Esme's umbrella and Judith Potts. And this research has very kindly been funded by Thomas Pocklington Trust. Um, and we've got some really interesting findings that I'm going to go through. And then lastly, uh, um, towards the end of this talk, um, I'll talk about a new website that we launched um, in December last year called gene.vision, um, which is basically an A to Z of genetic eye diseases, um, but it's got lots of information and support, and, and hopefully I'll give you a bit of um, insight into how you can all access and use that. So to begin with, um, an introduction into what Charles Bonnet syndrome is. Well, it was first described by Charles Bonnet, who is an 18th century philosopher. And he actually recounted that his grandfather had been um, experiencing visual hallucinations. Um, and he, he published this work. Um, and it's essentially defined as visual hallucinations that occur when individuals are losing their vision or their sight. And it is certainly not because of a mental health related problem. So these visual hallucinations can occur in any age group and from any eye disease. Now it's most commonly associated with the more commoner eye diseases that we see in the elderly, such as glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and also associated with some rarer diseases like inherited retinal diseases such as Stargardt's disease, Best's disease, retinitis pigmentosa, macular dystrophies. Um, at present, we don't have an exact figure for how many people are affected with this condition, um, but it is thought to be common, and we think that it affects up to 30% of patients who are experiencing sight loss. And again, there is no auditory or touch component to these hallucinations, which means there is no sound or, or touch. It is purely a visual hallucination that is related to the sight loss. Patients tend to experience two main types of hallucinations. They can have something called simple hallucinations, which may involve repeated patterns or shapes. Um, it can be colored lights, uh, grid work, brickwork patterns. And then you've got complex hallucinations, which are more about form. So that could include people, objects, landscapes, and sometimes individuals can experience a combination of both of those symptoms. And sometimes it's important to note that patients who have inherited retinal diseases um, often will experience some sort of flickers in their, uh, flickers of light on it, you know, from their retina potentially kind of discharging and stuff. Um, but that's again, very different. And we can usually pinpoint that. So for example, um, if you're seeing any colors, then that is usually probably related to Charles Bonnet syndrome because our retinas don't generate colors when, when it's, um, for example, cells that are potentially dying off. And then sometimes you might experience black floaters. Again, that is not Charles Bonnet syndrome. That's usually when the light is passing through the jelly of the eye, when it hits it in a certain way, it can cause these kind of black floaters in your vision. But if they're colored floaters, then definitely that could also be part of Charles Bonnet. So doctors can kind of differentiate whether the origins are from retinal signs or if it's due to Charles Bonnet. So why do patients have these visual hallucinations? Well, we we don't fully understand the answer for this yet. Uh, what we do know is that obviously as the retina is degenerating, it's not sending obviously all the signals from the eye to the brain. And so the brain in some patients becomes a bit hyperactive and it almost is trying to fill in the gap of where those impulses are reduced. And by doing so, it conjures this visual hallucination. 
So for, for those of you uh, who can see the slides and for those who can't, I've just put up in a, a, basically a photograph of a crowd of people. And there are lots and lots of faces in that crowd of people. Now, if you can imagine uh, if you have uh, a macular disease where your central vision is affected, then you may have an area in the central part of your vision that you are not able to see from. Now, if the signals are passing to the brain and you've got this gap in, of, of, of kind of sensory information from that central region, and, and it passes to the brain and the brain is, is hyperactive and it tries to fill in that gap, it may fill it in with a hallucination of something quite odd that really shouldn't be there. So I've just flashed up a, a little kind of elf type figure in the middle of the crowd. And, and sometimes that's exactly what it is. You may just see uh, something very strange that isn't quite right. Um, and, and that hallucination can vary in various shapes and forms. Um, you know, it may be, you know, a small child, it could be an axeman, it could be a, a butterfly, it could be all sorts of different kind of things. Um, so really on, on working with Judith Potts and Esme's umbrella, she was very keen to explore whether or not uh, we get Charles Bonnet syndrome in children and young adults. We, were, we know that it is very well characterized in the older generation because the burden of disease in the older generation is, is greater. And there had been a few case reports in the literature. Um, through Judith's helpline, there had been um, families that had called up and had expressed concern about their children who were experiencing um, visual hallucinations. So she asked me if I would be willing to kind of help to take a, a greater look at this. And so to start with, what we did is we essentially went through all the medical records of all children that had ever been seen at Moorfields Eye Hospital. And we searched for terms like Charles Bonnet syndrome, visual hallucinations, to see how many cases we could find with, with um, who were experiencing uh, these symptoms. Now, this study is, is published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, but I'm just going to go through um, some of the, the evidence for that. Now, just to also say, um, at the same time, I canvassed the opinion of my colleagues in the paediatric department at Moorfields and Great Ormond Street, and I sent them an email and I asked them if they had come across any children themselves with Charles Bonnet, and if they were asking families about it. And actually they were quite honest with me and they wrote back and they said, no, they hadn't. And they were actually quite embarrassed that they had never ever asked or informed any of the families about Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's because it wasn't at the forefront of their mind. It just didn't come into the kind of the history taking that, that they were doing. And so we felt that we really needed to start raising awareness amongst our healthcare professionals. So as I said, so we searched through all our electronic patient records between 2011 and, and 2020. Uh, we searched for the key terms and we collected all the case details. And we identified 13 patients in total. Almost 70% were male. And the, the mean age at which they had started to experience Charles Bonnet syndrome was 11 years of age. So, you know, an age at which they can very accurately give a history and tell us what's going on. Often you, would, you may query this in the younger children, for example, the under kind of five or six years of age, because you're not sure if it's an imaginary friend or, or how truthful you know, the report is of what they're seeing. But I think when children get past seven and eight, um, certainly they're much better at, at conveying what they're seeing and expressing it, and, and you can kind of trust their, their reports. So we found that the, the median age of onset was 11 years. Um, the majority of the patients had a reduced visual acuity. Uh, essentially, um, their vision was 
basically in the region of the top letter of the um, the charts that we we have in the hospital. So what I would call 660 vision, the, the big letter A at the top of that, that um, Snellen chart. And um, six of those patients were registered as sight impaired or severely sight impaired. Now, um, we found that just over 60% of these children were diagnosed with an inherited retinal disease. And as you're probably all aware, um, inherited retinal diseases are caused by changes or mutations within our genetic code, within our DNA. And that change essentially doesn't allow uh, the production of a correct protein uh, in the light sensitive cells at the back of the eye. And that essentially means that the cells don't work properly and they can end up degenerating and dying off. And that's what leads to the sight loss. Now, of all of those patients that had the inherited retinal diseases, the most common background disease was Stargardt's disease. So we saw that in five of these children, all of them had had genetic testing and had confirmed mutations in the ABCA4 gene. And as you know, Stargardt's disease is a macular dystrophy and it affects your central vision. And in children, children usually present in mid to late childhood. So, you know, potentially around the age of seven, eight, um, and they go on to um, uh, develop uh, more severe signs um, as they grow into adulthood. Um, and it affects around one in 8,000 to 10,000 uh, individuals. So um, we found, because the study that we looked at, we didn't look at just under 16s, we included those under the age of 25. So those were the young adult proportion. And so what we found was that in the Stargardt's patients, the uh, onset of the visual hallucinations ranged between the age of five and 24 years of age. It affected patients from different backgrounds. So the, the predominant uh, group were the ca Caucasian British uh, uh, background. Uh, there was a Pakistani child as well. And again, the, the, their vision was around the, the level of being able to see the, the big letter at the top of the Snellen chart. And again, they reported a range of hallucinations from, from those simplex shapes just to color it, colored flickered lights, zigzaggy lines, um, to more complex images. And so I, I just wanted to talk to you about one particular case. So this was a, a 10 year old boy uh, who had moderate vision levels. So he was seeing um, kind of mid range of the chart. Um, it was picked up that he had or was experiencing Charles Bonnet syndrome by his low visual aids optometrist. That was the other thing we did in the study is we we asked who had reported these cases and the consultants were not very good at reporting. The majority of patients were reported by the optometrist or by a trainee doctor in clinic. And it may be because those individuals have more time with the patients, are taking more detailed histories. Um, and it, it's another reason why we need to kind of spread the word to all people that are in contact with patients um, GPs, optometrists, orthoptists, um, social workers, eye clinic liaison officers, so we can just start having the conversation in case it has been missed by people. So this poor old 10 year old boy, was see, see, he was he's seeing simple shapes, but he also was, see, was seeing menacing distorted faces. He actually reported be, being quite frightened and very upset by this. And the parents had reported him having quite disrupted sleep because the, the hallucinations were actually more frequent at night when he was particularly anxious or distressed. So this patient was referred to a pediatrician and to a pediatric counselor. They had advised him to have quiet story time at bedtime, not kind of scary stories, just gentle ones that would help him relax. He was prescribed melatonin to help with his sleep disturbances and was given verbal information on, on coping mechanisms for Charles Bonnet syndrome and directed to Esme's umbrella. 
Um, and he was advised to contact the GP if he needed further help for this. Now, the impact is, is vast with children. Um, these complex hallucinations can really cause fear, anxiety, affects your sleep, your appetite. A lot of the patients in this study were seeing hallucinations related to their food. So um, Judith, I'm so pleased, is on the call and she will join me in the question time today. But both of us have had so many reports of individuals seeing slugs on their plate of food or maggots and stuff. And actually in one patient, it, it, it basically caused an eating disorder. They just did not want to eat because it, what they were seeing was so off-putting. Uh, one individual dropped out of university as they weren't able to cope. The hallucinations were so plaguing that they couldn't focus, they couldn't concentrate, they couldn't develop um, relationships with other people. Um, another patient described them as not upsetting at all or disruptive. So just because I've talked about the kind of worst case scenario, there are a number of patients that are quite comforted by their hallucinations or not bothered by them. Um, and unfortunately, from our study, 50% uh, of the clinical notes didn't detail any impact on lifestyle and well-being, which means that it was probably maybe talked about. But if it's not documented, then, you know, we have no evidence for that. It's important to know that adults can rationalize hallucinations. If we warn people about them and then they develop them, they can understand that what they're seeing is not real. But previous case studies in children, especially those under eight, have shown that children believe those hallucinations to be real. And there are stories of children seeing gargoyles coming to life and them thinking that those are real and having a real maladaptive response to those. Um, so it's not something that we should be taking lightly. So the next step is we really need to understand how common Charles Bonnet syndrome is in children. We need to understand the true impact, the psychological impact to patients and how we can provide support to them and how to manage these patients. So uh, working with Thomas Pocklington Trust and my team are undertaking a multi-centre national prospective study to try to put our fingers on how frequent Charles Bonnet syndrome is affecting children. Uh, we've managed to uh, uh, partner up with the um, British and Irish Orthoptist Society. Now, uh, for any of you on the call that have children, you'll know that when you come to a, a paediatric clinic, you see an orthoptist who helps measure the vision of children. Um, and we thought they might be a great point of contact because, you know, they'll be seeing the patients to measure their visions and they can start asking patients about Charles Bonnet, just informing them about it. And I think it's important that every single one of you on this call just starts to spread the word to talk about it, because there are simple coping mechanisms out there. Knowing about it will help people deal with it. It's the unknown that is what is, is scary about Charles Bonnet syndrome. And just to say, in children, that maladaptive uh, response and the fear can make them think that they might have some sort of mental illness like schizophrenia, for example. And in contrast, it's the adults uh, that are developing it who may be worried about dementia. Equally, both of these things can, can, can be significant um, and cause anxiety and depression. And so we, we need to act early and knowledge is, is power in this case. So the other, the other little thing that I just wanted to share with you was that over the lockdown period, um, I actually offered to do, this is the first lockdown, uh, when uh, a lot of uh, patients' appointments were being cancelled, we were only seeing emergency patients in our eye clinics, um, and, I, and I felt that I needed to sort of help because a lot of my patients, certainly in, in uh, the inherited retinal diseases, were not having their routine appointments anymore. And so I offered to do these Ask the Expert sessions with um, three of the uh, uh, three UK sight loss charities where I had a weekly clinic and patients could book in and have a chat about their condition. 
sorry i didn't do it for macless society but maybe <laughs> i'm here today <laughs> you're, you're here now it's um, right you're forgiven that's no, fine that's fine um so um but but one of the things that that emerged especially from the retina uk patients that um i spoke to was they were reporting worsening worsening uh, hallucinations from their charles bonnet syndrome and particularly one gentleman was telling me he was almost suicidal and i i had immediately got in touch with judith about him too um but it it conversations with judith and and speaking to patients and the charities made me think was this was there a relationship between COVID-19 and these worsening Charles Bonnet syndrome? So we, we undertook a study where we contacted 45 patients with Charles Bonnet. Uh, their mean age was uh, close to 70 years, 60% were female, and a, a large proportion, over 40%, had macular disease. Um, and we went through questionnaires to elucidate the features of the, their visual hallucinations during the COVID-19 lockdown in particular, um, and their perceived triggers for, for their visual hallucinations. Now, these are all patients who were known to have Charles Bonnet and were actively suffering from it. And what we found was that over 55% of patients reported an increase in their visual hallucinations. And close to 50% reported changes in the nature of those hallucinations and not for the better, they reported them being more sinister. 53% reported changes in their emotional response to those hallucinations. It was inducing more fear and anxiety and very close to 70% of the patients reported greater feelings of loneliness and social isolation. And 60% of those patients had not accessed any form of support services. So the perceived triggers were well, loneliness was top and that was found to be significantly uh, related to the, the change in the nature of the hallucinations. Close to 50% of the patients attributed it to reduced physical exercise, not being able to go out and, and, and do kind of activities of daily living. A third attributed it to watching and reading chronic stressful news. So the number of cases, the number of deaths every day. Um, and a quarter of patients thought it may be due to reduced access to healthcare. So I think what's important is social connection, not being isolated, staying in touch with each other, accessing community support groups. From a hospital perspective, I've fed this back, but not necessarily cancelling hospital appointments, but offering telephone consultations, um, having eye clinic liaison officers or genetic counsellors call patients just to check in with them. And then for, for individuals themselves to be accessing the charity helpline. So Esme's Umbrella, the Macular Society and the RNIB. And I'm sure um, Geraldine and um, Colin will, will give you more information about this um, in a moment. So just on that, I think I might pause here. Um, I just want to thank Judith, obviously. Um, for, for driving all of this. Dr. Lee Jones, who is a psychologist that works on our team, that um, undertook a lot of the, the groundwork and the questionnaires on for the COVID-19 um, uh, paper. And uh, Lara Ditzel-Finn, who is um, also got an MSc in psychology, but is a, a, an eye clinic liaison officer at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And they, Lee and Lara are currently doing structured interviews uh, with individuals, um, parents and children that are suffering from Charles Bonnet syndrome. So if there is anyone on the call um, that has a young child or a grandchild um, or just a parent that knows that their child is suffering from this and wants to help us with some of the research just to understand that psychological impact, then please do get in touch with me. Um, so maybe I'll just pause here before I go on to gene vision. And, and I'd like to ask Judith as well, maybe to join me, but we're very happy to take any questions on Charles Bonnet syndrome. Brilliant. 
Okay. I'll just stop sharing for the moment and yeah. then we can go back. Excellent. So, uh, Judith, do you, uh, I, I, I hadn't forgotten you, I promise. I was waiting for this exact moment. Um, so, uh, do you just want to say hello? Hi, how are you? Okay. I'm absolutely fine, thank you. And, um, you know, just delighted that uh, uh, Maria Musaji is doing this piece of work and she's done the previous piece that she spoke about. Children are very, very close to my heart. I've worked a great deal over the years with child actors and I know how awful it is to have Charles Bonnet syndrome when you are an adult. And I can only assume that as a child, it must be utterly, utterly terrifying. So thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Brilliant. So Jerry, has that, what, what questions have come through the chat? Shall we, get that way? Um, we haven't got any at the moment, I'm afraid. Um... Gosh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> oh, hang on. Somebody just one put one through. Um, Dis please discuss ways of limiting the effect of Charles Bonnet. We advise breathing, this person says. I don't know where they're from. So, so yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand over to Judith because she's got the exhaustive list. But um, <laughs> essentially, um, there, it's distractive techniques is what you need um, to basically jog that visual hallucination out of the way and there are there are various things you can do so one of the things is just do an activity so go and switch on the light or make a cup of tea or uh you know move your eyes from side to side the, these are the kind of things that you know you find a way uh, reaching out touching the hallucination will get rid of it it's it's almost like you're getting another part of your brain to start working so the visual hallucination part just disappears but um, I'm going to go to Judith because Judith literally has the most extensive list of, of coping mechanisms don't you Judith? Well I do have a great number which I have collected um, over the last five years from people with the condition so uh, Maria is absolutely right you uh, if you shunt your brain into another gear really and so by stretching out to the hallucination clapping your hands clicking your fingers uh, singing People tell me singing is great, um, whistling, as Maria said, switching on a light or switching off a light, try different uh, light bulbs. The LED light bulbs work for some people, uh, but not for others. Nothing works for everybody. Um, the other thing that, that we've been talking about recently um, is, is just, and this doesn't work for everybody, and you have to be careful what medication you're taking at the same time, but try eating ginger or drinking ginger ale, because people tell me that helps. I have no idea. We have no research, but why not give it a go? Um, also, uh, omega-3, apparently, people, there is a, a piece of research somewhere happening about that. I don't know the result, but that kind of thing is useful, maybe. But certainly, anything, and each person gets their own um, way of resolving this, but just something which distracts the brain. And in, in a moment, uh, when I get to the Gene Vision website, um, I will go onto the Charles Bonnet syndrome page and I've got a little box of, of coping mechanisms as well. So then you, you can also read that in, in your own time. Um, I, I, I can like see a few of, more questions have come through now. Yeah, yeah. I like this idea of ginger ale, Judith. Can I put some, yeah. spiced, <laughs> rum with, can I put some spiced rum with it though? Is that, is that... Oh, I would have thought so, definitely, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Okay, that lady was uh, from South Africa. I'm assuming she's actually calling in from South Africa, which is amazing. That's wow. brilliant. Okay, um, so the next one is, are there any differences between CBS in adults and children? So um, I, I would say no, not that we're aware of at the moment. Um, interesting, just before we started this call, we were talking about the types of hallucinations that certain people see. I would say now, the children, uh, the children that I've spoken to very much tend to report insects, uh, spiders on their bed and bees close to their nose and stuff. Um, obviously there was the, the poor lady with the, um, the, the, the slugs as well. Um, and uh, then there's the young boy, the case example I gave that had the, the menacing faces. 
none of the children have reported the kind of the military figure <laughs> or the mm. axemen, thank goodness, um, uh, or the zombie. So, so I suppose, and th th there is a lot more research that needs to be done. We need to get big enough numbers to kind of question all of this. Um, but this is what we were talking about. Are, are that there are certain forms that are created, but our perception of them and, and who we are and in which cultural background we live in or decade we live in maybe um, relates to what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, Judith, anything else to add on that? Uh, no, not really. It's just we, we don't know. I mean, as as each uh, as I take each call or read each email, I learn something else um, about this uh, really um, bizarre condition. Uh, I, I mean, this probably what I'm about to say, this probably won't affect children, but it does occur to me that if uh, there is an adult listening who has Charles Bonnet syndrome, it is worth going to your GP and having the medication that you are taking for other conditions reviewed, because we do know, and it's on my website, that there are certain medications that have uh, visual hallucinations as side effects. So if you are taking one of those and you have Charles Bonnet syndrome, you're getting a kind of double whammy. I just thought it was worth mentioning that, but obviously that won't affect children because this medication is not the sort of thing I think that children would take. Okay, thank you very much. So somebody else has asked about the, the fear provoking, the sort of scary hallucinations. And I think we do talk about those, but people I've spoken to, you know, they're not always scary. No. No, it's, it's, a, it's, and we don't know why as well. We don't understand why some people do have these very scary images, complex images, and why some people don't. And some people, all I would say, um, again, all of this is anecdotal evidence from speaking to patients and, and kind of gathering information. But certainly when you're stressed or anxious, it does change the... Um, the, the quality of that image that you're seeing. So it can make it more fearsome. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that definitely precipitates more kind of negative hallucinations than if you're very happy and peaceful, you might have a more benign type of hallucination. But um, I, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, and again, you know, when, we, when I just, as I've just been speaking, when I think about the children and I've said they've seen spiders, well, to them, a spider is very scary. Mm. So oh, if we scale it down to, you know, a seven-year-old mm. seeing spiders on his bed and he's petrified of spiders, that's that's what he's seeing. Um, it's probably, a, you know, relatable to, you know, uh, so, something scary that an adult is seeing. So it, it may be part of the brain that is, is you know, being triggered by that, but we, we just don't know. Judith, anything? No, all I was going to say was, uh, uh, you're absolutely right, of course, Maria, about everything, really. I mean, you're, you're saying, telling us all um, so clearly. I, I think that the, the most important thing to realise is that this condition, whether people see something scary or not, gets in the way of everyday life. So the, the lady who was uh, trying to make a cake, I spoke to the other day, and leaves and um, and slugs and all sorts mm. of things were falling into the mixing bowl. Well, it, it's not scary, but it gets in the way of everyday life. And, and even if it's something beautiful, you can't choose when it happens. So it would be lovely to be able to lie down and think, OK, I'll have that wonderful gardening documentary now. But it doesn't work like that. Mm. Actually, that, <laughs> so that, I, that's completely relatable, actually, Judith, because as I said at the beginning, I still get colour floaters. Uh, which is Charles Bonnet, and sometimes in my left eye is better than my right, and they generally happen in my left eye and close down the vision in my left eye. So it's a bit of a pain, really, sometimes. Any other questions, uh, Jerry? Um, do we have one? We're time for one more. Um, time it's for about one more, how yeah. long? How long the um, the hallucinations last? Months? Years? Um, yeah. So so you know, again, interestingly you know, you may be told it lasts for a few months, but that's not actually accurate. We now know that it can last for years. And I think Colin has just been the example of that because Colin, how long have you experienced it for? Uh, 40 years. 
Uh, so we do have patients that, and so, you know, again, I would, I would say that everybody is an individual. We can't at the moment predict whether you're going to uh, have it for a few months or for longer than that. And that's why it's so important that actually we disseminate this information about how to cope with them because if they're there for a long time and I mean it's similar it's similar to you know in a way inherited retinal diseases themselves I mean a question that I'm constantly asked is you know how quickly am I going to deteriorate and the answer is that there is so much variation between patients and even between individuals within the same family yet you have the same genetic change uh, only time will really tell. We monitor you over a few years and see what's happening. But um, I, I would not ever guarantee that this is going to go away after a few months because it, we may be wrong. Judith? Okay. Thank you. No more questions, Colin. Brilliant. Lovely. So I okay. just quickly jump back to Gene Vision then, shall I? Yeah. Yes, please do. Yes. I've only got two slides on this. So. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, Okay, everyone. So <clears throat> uh, as I said, in December last year, uh, we launched a website called uh, gene.vision. So um, I'll go onto the Google browser in a moment and just type it in, but it's www.gene.vision, V-I-S-I-O-N. Um, and we have spent about 18 months to two years creating this website. Um, it's funded by the National Institute for Health Research at Moorfields Eye Hospital and UCL Institute of Ophthalmology and Retina UK. And it is a resource, an A to Z on rare genetic eye disorders for everybody. So it's written and edited by specialists like myself and Professor Andrew Webster, who a lot of you will know, um, and other colleagues in my department. And it's been edited by the patients themselves as well and the leading charities. Um, as I said, it's, it's for everyone. So when you enter the site and you type in, for example, Stargardt's or Best Disease, uh, you will see an entry that says Best Disease for Patients and Best Disease for Professionals. And essentially they're mirror images in terms of information the one for patients is written in what I hope is a lay wording so that you can all read it, understand it. And then the page for professionals is just got a bit more medical jargon, but you can access that page too um, and have a read of, of the information that we provide to the healthcare professionals. And it basically gives a very in-depth overview about your condition, the latest research that is underway relating to it, practical aspects such as Charles Bonnet, education, employment, driving, family support, and then the links to all the relevant organizations, including the Macular Society. It's very patient friendly. Uh, there are lots of kind of videos on there and um, the explanations into kind of the research, what is gene editing, what's gene therapy, what's RNA therapy. Um, and we have worked with patients to develop this. So we've had patient focus groups who've come in throughout the course of the development of this to tell us what works and what doesn't. It, we've had two digital accessibility consultants, uh, one who's deaf blind and one who has a sight loss condition who have tested it with all the, the, the software. Um, so we know that it is fully accessible to you. And this is just uh, an example of what the page looks like for Stargardt's disease for patients. Um, it has a nice uh, quick link area, which you can just scroll down and read further, or you can go to what you're looking for, but there's a nice overview, information about the condition, treatments, current research into Stargardt's, practical advice, how to get a referral to be seen at a specialist center, um, such as Moorfields or one close to where you may be, um, and the importance of genetic testing. So if any of you are again are on this call that have what you know to be an inherited or genetic condition, it's so important to get genetic testing at the moment because there are so many clinical trials underway that you may be able to access. 
Um, there's further information and support, a patient's perspective, then references so you can go up and read about the condition in more detail. And then there's the link to access the professional page too. And we've got equally, we've got patient, uh, pages for patients on cone and cone rod dystrophies, best disease. And I'm just going to show you some of the other features. So I'm going to stop and share, stop that. And let me see if I can share my web page. Here we go. So, um, I don't know, have I just gone and clicked on the same? Yeah, sorry. So that's my, just to say, by the way, actually, I'm just going to end my presentation before jumping onto the internet. But just to let you know, again, if any of you have any questions related to your condition or to Charles Bonnet or anything that I've spoken about today, then feel free to email me. My email address is m.musaji, that's M -O -O -S -A -J -E -E at nhs.net um, and I'll, I'll be very happy to, to, to help and support you in any way I can. So let me stop this slideshow and uh, let me go to the internet. There we go. So you should be able to see um, Google, a Google page. So if you go to your Google search or even into the browser button, and you just type in gene dot vision, it will straight away take you to the page. And then um, once you get to the page on the top, you've got um, some tabs. I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, so you've got the information and support and there's a nice drop down menu and you've got information on the eye, the anatomy of the eye. So if you want to learn more about the retina and the macula and all these words that you hear, you can get really nice information on that. How to see a genetic eye specialist, coping with sight loss, information on eye clinic liaison officers, education and learning, em employment support, family support, registration for sight impairment, Charles Bonnet syndrome, and driving in alternative transport. And I'm just going to click on the Charles Bonnet one just to show you. So again, you've got your quick links, but if you scroll down, it will give you a really nice um, overview about uh, what Charles Bonnet syndrome is with a video. Um, it will tell you about why we think it's happening, the causes of it, um, links to our research, some of the conditions that it can occur in. And then this is the box here under treatment. So coping mechanisms that we talked about. So looking from right to left once every 15 seconds without moving your head, blink your eyes once or twice, try to touch the hallucination, stare straight at it, turn your head to alternative sides, then move your head towards each other, walk around the room or to another room, shine a torch from below your chin or in front, but not directly into your eyes, change the light level in your room. And then a lot about kind of education, current research, the Charles Bonnet and children that I talked about, and then all the links to all the support groups that will help you with this. Um, so that just gives you an example of, of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And if you just click back on the logo or the back button, it will take you to the home page. But if I just uh, type in um, best disease, so it, it automatically come up best disease for patients. We call it best trophinopathies <laughs> <best trophinopathies laughs> for, for professionals. But let's click on best disease for patients. So you have these quick links, as I said, and at the end, at the bottom of this is the, is the one for, for professionals. But just to go through again, it gives you an overview of the condition and then symptoms, um, the causes of this, how it's diagnosed, gives you pictures so that you can, you know, share this with family and friends who are interested more about your condition, the way it's inherited. And it would tell you all about that. Um, and there are links then to the genetic counseling pages and the genetic testing pages, and then talks about supportive measures um, and uh, the current research. So the gene therapies that are underway for it, stem cells um, and practical advice for uh, living with best disease. So lots and lots to read through. 
On the top, there's a, a tab for conditions, genetics. Again, the genetics tab is great. There's a whole load for patients about family planning, genetic counseling. Um, the gene cards is mainly for doctors, but you can actually go and type your gene in and it will give you information about that. And the last tab that I think is really um, important is the research tab. So you can go into that and you can click and learn all about all the kind of new types of research that are underway. So you have a background knowledge as to what it's all about. Um, and then uh, just on the homepage, you can learn about us. Uh, there's a contact us button. So you can click on that and you actually can enter your name and your email. You can fill in what condition you have or want to learn about and, and register to get updates. For example, if a clinical trial is being launched on star guards or best um, and we can then contact you and say oh there's a new trial would you you know would you like to um, participate in and you can write some comments and you just got to agree to the GDPR statement and just click submit um, so just with that I'm going to leave that actually there and just allow you to go on it and you know feel free again to email me any feedback if there's something particularly missing it is still a you know to a work in progress we're constantly having updates and adding new genes and new conditions but but do get in touch and let me know and so with that absolutely thank you so much for inviting me to speak today no it's been absolutely brilliant uh just i i think gene vision the, the website is great so i i was uh, was really eager for you to show people it it's, i think it's really accessible it gives them so much information uh, in, and as you say, in simple language that, that even people like me can understand. So, uh, you know, when I can do it, most people can, I think. So great. Excellent. Thanks ever so much. Um, so, Jerry, it would be rude, rude um, to, to, to let you go without you saying anything about what we're up to in our research, uh, from, from our research side. As most people know, we are a research organisation as well as offering information and support. So what we really, what's going on with us then, uh, Jerry? Thank you. Um, I just do want to say how good Gene Vision is. It's, it's a fantastic resource for me and for, to help us answering query, inquiries. Yeah, so for those of you who may not be very familiar with what the research we fund at the Macular Society, we have a, a research, pro, a growing research program, um, which has included research on Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, we funded a project which finished last year, and I think I saw it mentioned on, on the as Maria scrolled through the pages, um, a potential treatment for Charles Bonnet um, called transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, and um, that project finished last year, but the results were quite promising and I'm hoping that they're gonna take that forward. And I actually encourage them to put in another application to us this year. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed because we'd love to see that through um, to an established treatment for, for CBS. Um, but, we invite applications every year for um, from researchers to do to do research. It's usually two or three year projects, um, and we fund about usually about eight each year. We've got a um, budget this year of one point two five million, and we're just about to decide what fund what we're going to be funding this year. So hopefully there'll be another new tranche of projects. But we've got about twenty projects on the go at any one time, and we really want to grow that. Um, that research program, um, exp explore new areas of research. Um, you know, hopefully I'd like to see more research on the things, we do a lot of research on age-related macular degeneration, but I'd really like us to see more applications in on, on the more rare diseases. Um, that would be great. Brilliant. I'll stop there because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Not really. It's fine. Anyway, look. Anyway, it's 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 good. It's really interesting to uh, to watch our, our research funds grow and, and where it goes. And as you say, if we can sort of direct it to sort of rarer diseases, that would be fantastic. Great, oh, brilliant. Um, so with that, just leads me to thank you all for coming along, uh, Judith. Thank you for your time as well. It's been it was always a pleasure to have you along as well. So. Um, and so how, how's the best way for people to get hold of you? Is it through your website, Judith? Uh, it's through my website, www.charlesbonnetsyndrome.uk or by email, which is Esme's Umbrella, all lowercase, no apostrophe, E-S-M-E-S -E and then umbrella at gmail.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you for coming along too. Maria, thanks ever so much for your time. 
uh, and uh, and thanks to everyone else. So uh, and that's it. So our next our next session um, was, will be on um, what is it on, Colin? Uh, it's Pete Kofi. He's going to come and talk about the forgotten uh, disease or macular disease, which is myopic macular disease and some of the thoughts he's got in those areas. That's going to be an interesting session. It's always the last Thursday of each month. Sometimes it's in the evening, sometimes it's during the day, but just check out the uh, the, the e-newsletter e from the Macular Society to find out more details. So brilliant. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, we'll see you uh, on the next on the next session. I hope. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.